This conflict between the Bible and so-called science, I suppose, began uh, with the publication of Charles Darwin's book, Origin of the Species. So it, it is really, isn't it? It's a, it's a conflict between what the Bible has to say and what Darwin uh, said in his book and, and those, of course, who followed him. The Bible is an old book written thousands of years ago, whereas Charles Darwin's book is relatively new, what, just a couple of hundred years ago. Let's try and state as simply as possible what the theory of evolution is about. It says that planet Earth was a suitable site for the natural elements to become organised by chance into a simple form of life. And then it goes on to say that during the course of millions of years, this simple life form evolved into the vast complexity of life that is evident today. And they are the two, I suppose, main pillars of the theory of evolution, put as simply as possible. We sometimes see diagrams like that showing how that we humans have evolved really from monkeys over lots and lots of small transitional stages and they in turn have evolved from something uh, less less complex once again until we get right back to something which is simple. Let's just think about this for a moment. Was planet Earth a suitable site for life to somehow appear by chance? What does the Bible have to say about that? And that's what, what, what I want to consider uh, to begin with. These are words that the Almighty God addressed to Job in the Bible. Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? And I suggest that that is exactly what the evolutionists are doing. But let's move on. God says to Job, Where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Now that really should make us all think. We weren't there, were we? Darwin wasn't there. None of the evolutionists were there. And yet they seem to have a, a lot to say about how things happened. Well, let's move on. Critics of the Bible say, Oh, look, the Bible speaks about the earth as though it's got some sort of a foundation. What they need to remember is that the Bible is speaking about the foundation principles on which the earth has been made. Just in case there's any doubt about that, we read that in the same book, Job chapter 26 and verse 7. He stretcheth out the north over the empty place and hangeth the earth upon nothing. And as far as we're concerned, you can't hang anything on nothing, can you? It just falls to the ground. And I suppose for, for centuries people have wondered what that verse meant. He hangs the earth on nothing. And yet now we know, don't we, that that is exactly what God did and continues to do. The earth is hung, as it were, upon nothing. It is suspended in space. So, the Bible said thousands of years ago that the earth was hung on nothing. There's one theory, the Greeks, um, 300 BC, they believed that the earth was supported on the back of Atlas. Who supported him? I don't know. But that's just one of many theories that have been put forward over the ages to try and show how the earth is supported. 
all of them words without knowledge see God asked another question of Job in that same chapter who has laid the measures of the earth I think when God said that to Job it didn't mean do you know how big the earth is he was talking about much more than that let's just consider shall we some of the measures which are necessary for the earth to support life there's the first one the earth turns on its axis once every 24 hours we don't find it's one day 23 hours or maybe 25 hours it's always exactly the same and which I suggest here that this is the first measure which is necessary for the earth to support life but there's something wrong with that diagram isn't there if we look just before we move on at Jeremiah chapter 33 and at verse 25 I'll just read, read two verses there. Thus saith the Lord, If my covenant be not with day and night, and if I have not appointed the ordinances of heaven and earth, then will I cast away the seed of Jacob and David my servant, so that I will not take any of his seed to be rulers over the seed of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. See, God says, I, That's my covenant. I've made that, I've, I've said that that will always be the case. Day will always follow night, night will always follow day. And he links it with something more wonderful, uh, which speaks about the promises that God made to Abraham, but that's another story. But let's just think about this for a moment. We did say there was something wrong with that diagram, didn't we? The axis of the earth is inclined it's inclined at an angle of 23.5 degrees you know that just happens to be right for the earth to support life there's our second measure here's the third measure the distance between the sun and the earth 93 million miles this is not drawn to scale obviously but we're just trying to show here that here is another measure it's necessary for the earth to be that distance from the sun so that the earth can support support life fourth measure Let, let's tie those two ideas together and we're thinking now about the earth as it's turning on its axis which is inclined it moves on an orbit around the sun and we try to show on the diagram here that at this stage we've got summer in the southern hemisphere because the southern hemisphere is subject to more sunlight than the north so in the north is winter that's where we are at the moment isn't it but six months later, as the Earth moves on its orbit around the Sun, we've got the opposite. Now it's summer in the north and winter in the south. In a way, it's so simple, isn't it? And yet it's so majestic as well. Who would have thought to devise a system like this to give us seasons? We read this in the book of Genesis, the book which comes under most uh, criticism from the critics. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, day and night shall not cease. And God says, they are my covenants. I have covenanted with the people of the earth that these things will not change and we simply take them for granted don't we that summer will always be followed uh, on eventually by winter and so on 
the seasons will move around in their course. Here's measure number five. The distance now between the Earth and the Moon. We know that the Moon, amongst other things, is responsible for giving us the tidal movements of the oceans of the world. 240,000 miles away. Just happens to be exactly right. We know if the Moon were a bit closer, it will cause massive tidal waves. Or if it were a bit further away, it wouldn't do its job at all and there would be no tides. So there's measure number five. We've hardly started yet. Let's think about further evidence of design on planet Earth. The air that we breathe. Exactly the right amount of oxygen. Roughly one-fifth, isn't it? Of the air that we breathe is oxygen. Now that is just right for us to be able to breathe in oxygen and breathe out carbon dioxide. We know don't we that if we sealed off this room that we are in eventually there will be no oxygen left. Our bodies would have converted it into carbon dioxide and we would all suffocate and we would die. But God has put in place an amazing system to maintain that balance. We know, don't we, that plant life and ocean life uh, produce oxygen so that that balance is always there. There's measure number seven. How about the water that we drink? Interestingly enough, water behaves differently to most substances. Most substances, as they cool down, contract. But water does until it gets to around about 4 degrees centigrade. And it starts to expand. Different to everything else. Now that has been designed so that the fishes do not die in the oceans. Because when ice begins to form, it forms on the top of the, the rivers and so on. And so the life below can still exist. There's measure number eight. And two amazing systems to prevent it from becoming stagnant because stagnant water will not support life. There's measure number nine. And once again, we've hardly started to consider what is necessary for the earth to support life. Now, if we just look at those nine measures, we say for all of these to exist by chance at the same place on Earth, the chances are it's one times two times three times four and so on. It's 362,880 to one. And that's the chance. If, if it is chance, that's, that's the odds. 362,880 to 1. But as we've said, we've hardly begun to start, really. This is what one scientist said. So many essential conditions are necessary for life to exist on Earth that it is mathematically impossible. The, the number will be so big that it's just an impossibility. They can't all exist on Earth by chance at the same time so says dr morrison who was once the president of the new york new york academy of science now there we see a model of our solar system we can see the sun in the middle and the planets uh, and they're able to move around the sun in the way that it actually happens uh, in, in the solar system. They're not supported on nothing, of course, are they? They've got to be supported by these metal arms. Now, if we look in the centre of this here, we see that there is quite a number of gearing to make sure that all these planets move at the right speed around the sun. 
we ask the question, was this designed? It was obviously designed, wasn't it? All those gears, they didn't just happen to suddenly evolve from nowhere and then organise themselves so that this would work. It's absurd, is it not, to say that this was not designed. Whoever did design it would not be very pleased. And yet, evolutionists are prepared to say the real thing. Oh, that just, that just evolved. It's all a matter of chance. Let's move a bit further out into space. And we look at all the stars in the sky. Now, round about 100 BC, there was a famous astronomer called Hipparchus. He said, and he was an expert, he said there were 1056 stars in the universe. Words without knowledge. We know now, don't we, that that is laughable, 1,056 stars. The Bible said, long before Hipparchus came along, that they were numberless. If your Bible still open at Jeremiah chapter 33, just look at verse 22. It says there, As the host of heaven cannot be numbered, neither the sand of the seashore measured, so will I multiply the seed of David my servant. She's making the comparison between the number of stars and the number of grains of sand on the seashores of the world. And it's saying, you can't count them, can you? And the Bible was right. Hipparchus was hopelessly wrong. Words without knowledge. So what does the Creator say about all this? We read these words in Isaiah 45. Thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, he created them. God himself that formed the earth and made it, he has established it. He created it not in vain, he formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. So here we find that God created the earth for a reason. He formed it to be inhabited. And if you look elsewhere in the Bible, we find he formed it to be inhabited with beings who would reflect his glory. That is his purpose with the earth. So just coming back to the theory of evolution, the second part, during the course of millions of years, this simple life form evolved into the vast complexity of life that is evident today. Now here's a quote from an evolutionist. The extreme rarity of transitional forms in the fossil record is the trade secret of paleontology. We don't want people to know this. The evidence is simply not there in the fossil record and there's an evolutionist acknowledging that and we, we could say a lot more about that. It's just not there. So diagrams like that, there is no evidence to support them. It's just a theory, an unproven theory. Michael Behe wrote this book, Darwin's Black Box. And this is what it says on the front cover of that book. No one can propose to defend Darwin without meeting the challenges set out in this superbly written and compelling book. In the book, he speaks about the many examples of irreducible complexity. He looks around and sees there are many systems in the world 
which are very, very complex. I suppose we humans fall into that category. But it, it talks about irreducible complexity. You can't reduce anything in these systems and still expect it to work. So just remove one thing and it all stops working. And that's what he means by irreducible complexity. So what we're saying is that Darwin's theory was dependent, first of all, on the basic unit of life, the cell, that's Darwin's black box, being very simple. Meet the simple cell. It's anything but simple. It's got so many different sections in it and all of them need to be there for it to work. We say, how did all this evolve into what used to be called a simple cell? When I went to school, I was taught that life started with the simple cell. And yet science now knows that there is no such thing as a simple living cell. They're all very, very complex indeed. And they're all very small as well. If we were to get uh, a typewriter or, or a computer to, to type a letter O, we could fit 40,000 of these cells inside a small letter O. Very, very small indeed. Now let's think about cell replication. And I want to think for a moment about how a human being is formed because it all starts with one cell and that cell has to replicate or duplicate so now we've got two cells and they have to replicate so now we've got four cells and then they have to replicate again we've got eight cells and so it goes on now there are different estimates as to how many cells there are in the human body. There's one, 50 billion cells. Many say more than that. So from one cell, the human body is formed in the womb. All these cells in many ways have to be identical. But at the same time, they have to be different. Just think, all the different types of cells in the human body, all from, <coughs> excuse me, all from one cell. Each organ in the body has to be in exactly the right place. It has to interact with all the others. We just said bone there. There are over 200 bones in the human body each exactly in the right position, each connected by ten tendons to muscles and then the nerves so that the brain can control all the different movements of the body. It's, it's mind-blowing really, isn't it, when we think about this, all from one cell. And when the child is born, very often we can identify the child as it grows up from the parent. Facial features, physical build, special talents and so on and so on. You see, this is beyond our understanding, let alone knowledge. David says in the Psalms, and there's a child one day old, I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And surely that sums it up, does it not? We read these words in the book of Ecclesiastes. As thou knowest not what is the way of the Spirit, the Spirit of God is power, nor how the bones do grow in the womb of her that is with child, even so thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all. We simply don't know, do we, 
how all this happens. We read in Isaiah's prophecy. God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So let's just think about the way in which humans uh, produce things. They do need evolution. See, there's an early motor car. A bit later. Later still. And eventually we've got a modern motor car. We've missed most of them out. But humans couldn't produce a modern motor car from scratch. They had to do it in lots and lots of small stages, improving things here and modifying things there. Unlike God, who from the beginning made things and they were, they were right the first time. No need to modify. Here's another example. How about flight? There's the first attempt that man made to fly and it was an absolute disaster. But we can see, can't we, how that it gradually evolves until we've got a modern aeroplane that can fly long distances. Now there we see the flight deck of a modern aircraft. We ask the question again, was that designed or did it all just happen? Absurd again, isn't it, to say that that just happened. It obviously was designed. And all these knobs and dials and switches are necessary for the aeroplane to fly. All that in the head of the bird. The Arctic turn flies 24,000 miles in eight months. It can fly halfway around the world and come back again to the same tree that it left originally. Or sometimes it's its offspring that come back to the same tree, the same place. We think we're clever with sat now, don't we? <laughs> a relative modern invention. But that's all in the head of the bird once again. God says to Job, does the hawk fly by your wisdom and stretch her wings toward the south? There's a hint there of um, the bird migrating, isn't there? So, so far, what is the evidence? Darwin thought evidence would be found in the fossil record to support his theory. Well, it hasn't. Darwin thought the cell was simple. Well, it isn't. So we ask the question now, are evolutionists prepared to at least give the Bible a fair hearing? And that's, that's the issue. Are they prepared to read it even? Because very often all they want to do is to pull verses out and criticise it so that they don't have to abide by what it's telling us. This appears on websites. A picture of the Bible with that sticker on the front. The author never reveals him or herself, but let's just highlight what it says on, or some of what it says on that sticker. Warning, this is a work of fiction. Exposure to contents for extended periods of time or during formative years in children may cause delusions hallucinations, decreased cognitive and objective reasoning abilities, and in extreme cases, pathological disorders, hatred, bigotry, violence. Now, I get the impression that whoever wrote that 
doesn't want people to read the Bible. They're doing their very best to dissuade anyone from reading that book. And you know, really, they've got everything upside down. It's human reasoning that leads to these things. And it's the Bible that push, teaches us to do the right things. Well, let's bring it up to date. Here we've got a free DVD that we can get from Richard Dawkins. It's called The Root of All Evil. In two parts, part one, The God Delusion, part two, The Virus of Faith, where he says that he views religion as a cultural virus that, like a computer virus, once downloaded into the software of society, corrupts many of the programs it encounters. Well, is he right? The same as Darwin, Dawkins' theory is dependent on two major assumptions. There's the first one, that popular Christianity is based on the Bible. Because what he does, he points to all the wars that have taken place in the world and he says, religion is at the bottom of all these. But that's not what the Bible teaches. That's popular Christianity, which is something entirely different. You see, we read in the Bible in the Old Testament, thou shalt not murder. We read in the New Testament, speak not evil one of another, brethren. Now, if everyone lived by these um, commandments, there would be no wars, would there? Dawkins' second major assumption is that there is no God. He bases his ideas on that very fact. We read in the Bible, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Don't be deceived, the Bible tells us, by these things. Um, if you've still got your Bible open, turn to Psalm 50. Psalm 50, and if we just start reading a few verses from Psalm 50 and verse 16. We read there, But unto the wicked God saith, What hast thou to do to declare my statutes, or that thou shouldest take my covenant in thy mouth? Seeing thou hatest instruction, and castest my words behind thee. When thou sawest a thief, then thou consentest with him, has been a partaker of adulterers, and so on. God says at verse 21, These things hast thou done, and I kept silence. Is it God is long-suffering? He waits and he waits for people to respond. But eventually, his judgments will come. What does that verse say? These things hast thou done, and I kept silent. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such an one as thyself. To judge God by human standards is a big mistake. And that's what Dawkins has done. To finish the verse, I will reprove thee, and set them in order before thine eyes. Now consider this ye that forget God, lest I tear you in pieces, and there be none to deliver. See, when God's judgments do come, they are indeed severe. Witness the flood in the days of Noah, or the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah in the days of Lot. Here's a book called The Dawkins Delusion. Dawkins is the one who is deluded, says Alistair McGrath. Addressing the conclusions of the God delusion point by point with the devastating insight of a molecular biologist turned theologian, Alistair McGrath dismantles the argument that science should lead to atheism and demonstrates instead that Dawkins 
has abandoned his much cherished rationality to embrace an embittered manifesto of dogmatic atheist fundamentalism. Strong words, aren't they? But that's what Alistair McGrath, who is a scientist, thinks about Richard Dawkins' book, The God Delusion. we we'll make that point next. The way in which we approach the Bible is important. We read these words in the letter of James. Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. You see, the Bible is able to save us and to give us everlasting life if we receive it with meekness. But the Bible will not help its critics. It's amazingly designed so that it will not do that. So, we have the choice. You see, God, as revealed in the Bible, does not force anyone to do anything or believe anything. He gives us the choice. So is it the Bible or Darwin and Dawkins? We have the choice. If we believe in creation, we are answerable to a creator. And I, says, I suggest that that is the reason why so many people do not accept the Bible. Because it tells us what we have to do. It tells us that there is a power greater than ourselves. And we humans don't like that. But if we do believe in creation, we have a wonderful prospect of becoming part of God's new creation. If, on the other hand, we want to believe in evolution, well, if it's all about chance or luck, it's a matter of time, isn't it, before the luck runs out? We read that in John chapter 17. This is eternal life, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And it's only in the Bible that we can do that. We can find out about what God has to say and what the Lord Jesus Christ is all about. Well, I hope this has made, made us think a little bit about this uh, debate between creation and evolution. And hopefully we can get down to reading our Bibles so that we can be ready for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ when he appears to the earth once again. Thank you.